Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another episode of On Air. Genuinely, genuinely excited today to be joined by Alex Elaine. Um, Alex Elaine is the Regional Sales Manager for EMEA at Lacework and in a minute he's going to tell you a bit more about himself quickly. Firstly, hi Alex, welcome to the show. Owen, awesome to be here. It's Friday and uh, feeling good today, so thanks a lot for having me on. Good stuff. And look, this is a really um, exciting conversation for me for two reasons. One is most of the people I interview on the podcast I've actually met before uh, and are in the network. You've come as a recommendation. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, we, 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 we put in touch. And since I've been following your content, and I just absolutely love your content, absolutely love what you're doing and what you're talking about. So uh, excited on that basis. But then also the topic is right where we want to be talking about, which is um, you know, focusing on sort of what makes a successful outbound SDR prospector cold call, whatever, whatever we want to call it, whatever you do, what, refer to it as in your business, um, and, and, and trying to get under the skin of what successful people do um, in prospecting. And I think this is clearly something that you you love talking about as well. So uh, yeah, so. absolutely. Super, super excited to just yeah chop it up and, and see how we pan out. But yeah, really passionate about the topic. So it should be fun. Brilliant stuff. Now, for those people that don't know you, give me the two minutes. Who's Alex? Who's Lacework? And let's just get an understanding of that. Yeah, awesome. So as you already said, currently with Lacework, a uh, company that are really disrupting the, the cloud security space, doing something really, really special there. Um, been with the business about seven weeks now. But prior to that, I was at AWS um, playing a big role in our growth and expansion for a service called Amazon Connect. Uh, and prior to that, I was one of the first members of the sales team at Twilio in EMEA. So uh, my career spans over 10 years now, mainly in, in tech and SaaS sales, uh, which is really where I found a home. Um, also beyond that, I spend a ton of time on LinkedIn. So I've become a two-time uh, LinkedIn top voice, only person from the UK, uh, I believe that's made that list for sales. Um, so I really try and do my best to, to help kind of raise the profile of sales uh, get more people in the space and, and share some tips and insights so people don't make all of some of the mistakes that I made throughout my career. Love it. And Alex, one thing I would say from your content, obviously I've only just started consuming it, but it really does stand out that you're there to help. You're genuinely trying to help people advance their careers and learn and it's about giving and I, I admire you for that. So I, I just thought I would say that uh, more than anything else, but let's focus in on the topic today. So um, you, you said there about your, your 10 years and, and, and helping people learn from some of the mistakes that you made. So maybe that's a really good place for us to start, to look back over the last 10 years of, of, of being out there, hitting quota, prospecting, talking to people, trying to, trying to get opportunities. What are some of those mistakes? So what are the, some of the big things that you look back on and go, mm. if I had my time again, wouldn't do that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that you know, when I look at sales as an overall at the moment, there's often this big debate of is it an art or is it a science? And when I started my career, I think what I had was that the passion, the energy, the enthusiasm, but I didn't really have any mechanisms in my mind so that I could be predictable and actually perform consistently. And so what I found myself sometimes doing is having a phenomenal month and then an OK month and then an amazing month. And actually for a sales leader, especially, what they're you know, looking for in their team members are people that can kind of be there month in, month out and deliver consistently and, and you know, someone that they can rely on ultimately. And so what I found is that I was really just operating in a way where I was kind of unconsciously competent, as you could say, right? I was delivering pretty good results, but didn't really have any mechanisms from which I could standardize that. So if I was able to go back, I think a big focus for me would be getting much more kind of systemization and some process and bringing in more of that kind of competent, uh, conscious competence, you could say, uh, into my game so that I was really delivering results on a much more consistent basis, which has really been a big focus of my career towards this latter stage. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept because quite often the greatest natural performers are people that have no idea why they're great and sure. taking the time to step back and perhaps try to understand why you're good at it presents opportunities for you to learn about how you can be better I'd imagine. Um, yeah and uh, you know and another point off the back of that Owen is actually you know especially when people get to a point where you're starting to coach and enable other people mm -hmm. If, if you can't translate the way that you perform and the way you're able to operate onto other people, 
what you'll find is that you'll always be a you know pretty special individual contributor but if you want to grow your career and help other people yeah. you, you can't help other people by winging it right you've got to be yeah. able to give them process and systems and help them be able to follow that and get better every day really valid point so let's go back to your uh, sales career and you hitting targets and quota were you when you first started out were you just naturally good are you one of the people that had to work at it and understand it like, do, do you just have the have that je ne sais quoi that makes you makes makes you good at it and then you learn or did you learn and get good yeah a, a lot of people often said i had the gift of the gab if you want to call it that <laughs> <Not quite laughs> age. but but to be honest Owen, i think I, I just had a big chip on my shoulder in a way when i started out because um quite a lot of people know i had a full scholarship studying law um, and I did that for eight months and I actually dropped out because I just didn't like it at all. It wasn't for me. Got out in the city and got my first sales role uh, doing printers and copiers and just, you know, making hundreds of cold calls a day. Yeah, <laughs> very tough gig, but, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. But the reason I say that is because when I started that role, because of what I'd given up, I did have this bit of a chip on my shoulder to say, look, I've got to now prove to me, prove to my mother, prove to everyone that actually this decision to give up, you know, a, a massive scholarship is going to be worth it. And so when I went into that role, I just went into it like an absolute train. And I just had this relentless mindset that I would just do whatever it took to rise to the top. So th there wasn't much strategy. There wasn't much focus but I knew I had a yellow pages and I had a phone book and I just had to make it happen. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, volume was just out of control at that time. Do you know what? I, I really hope that the answer is yes to this. Did you actually did get, go through yellow pages? At the very beginning. Yes, <laughs> yeah. me too. I remember those days. Oh. What were you selling at that time? Uh, well, uh, originally I was selling business coaching. Um, so oh, yeah. that was my very first, in an agency environment. So my very first, I had two, two clients I worked with. One was a business coach and one was a financial um, sort of uh, like key man insurance, that sort of stuff. So financial products. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're going back into, we're going back into nearly 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a, a little while ago, let's put it that way. Um, how did you get on? How did you find it back then? Um, do you know what? I loved it. I absolutely love people, talking to people. Um, I'm really glad we have the systems and processes in place to make us far more efficient nowadays. And, sure. you know, you look at the wastage, I'm sure you were the same for yeah. the, the yellow page. You knew nothing about them before you called. It was all guesswork. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I used to get through about 20 highlighters a day, just highlighting things and scribbling all over it and that sort of stuff. But um, best way to learn, though. Best way to learn. And, and that's it builds it. a lot of resilience. You know, you, you go through that. And actually now in my career, no, nothing feels quite as challenging, right? Because yeah. you built this insane foundation yeah. from day one. So yeah. yeah, it can only get better. And this is the thing, I, and this is maybe a question for you. SDRs now, to a degree, particularly in high growth tech companies, they're spoon fed. They've got all the tools. They've got MQLs coming in left, right and centre. We've got SDRs who've never made an outbound phone call in their lives and they're yeah. living off of thousands of leads coming in and, 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 and their demand gen team feeding them. Give them a phone and and, and a, a list of prospects to call with nothing more and they spend their time researching and sending emails and they don't pick up the phone we didn't have the choice of doing that i was still on fax machines <laughs> um so, so, so i guess it, to what degree you go back to that that experience it feels like it's a really good foundation platform and then it, the, the technology comes in and makes life better and easier and makes you more efficient sure. to, to what degree did you see the adoption of that make you better Maybe you can give me a sense of like what, what are the things that have stood out for you to, to take you from being really good but raw to actually I've got the right tools in place and now I'm going so much faster. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, you know, I always say to myself is that I can only scale me to a certain extent, right? To, I always say time is the most finite resource in the world. I can't manufacture more time. Um, so th the reason that that's important is I can make so many phone calls in a day, but what I want to do is get to a point where I maximize my efficiency with the amount of hours I have in the day. And then I leverage the tools to do the work when either I'm sleeping or, or to, you know, 10x the amount that I can scale and scale my ability to reach more people. Yeah. And so I think where I've become a lot smarter is, you know, carving out specific time windows to make those phone calls. And what's kind of crazy about this era is it feels like if you make phone calls, that's a differentiator in, in this era when, to me, it was just yeah. the norm, right, when I started out.
but you know making sure that you've got set times or you're picking up the phone and making those calls but then you use the tools and the software to, to do the hard work for you to, to give you more reach maybe you know before usual working hours or slightly after working hours and it puts you in a position where you've kind of got a double pronged approach of mm. you doing your work and then the tools doing the work almost on top yeah absolutely really interesting so you're in and you're talking about the phone there so if, if you don't know i am an absolute fan of the phone so we preach yeah. phone first and it's you know that doesn't mean we don't adopt other channels but we preach phone first for outreach yeah. what's your take on that you, you you're obviously adopting other channels you, you you've got a huge profile on linkedin that's not by accident that's by design right so you you clearly yeah. acknowledge the value of that as a channel and i'm guessing that drives a lot of it wherever you go that will drive a lot of inbound traffic into into you and opportunities that come to you um wh where do you see that adoption of channels and, and and kind of how much time you should distribute across those and you know how much should the phone still be a part of outreach just really get keen to get your opinion on that yeah, I think I'm very much like you. Uh, maybe it's in the DNA now. But for me, <laughs> it's the yellow pages treatment, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, um, it is absolutely foam first. I think that, you know, where we're quite fortunate now is some of the tooling that we have has allowed us to be more effective with our use of the phone, i.e. there's mm. tools that can give us prompts and, uh, you know, maybe alert us when there's good times to make phone calls and things like that. So some intelligence that we never had before but I just stand by to me that you, you can't beat the phone when it comes to the most effective means by which you've got outreach. You know, you can navigate objections in real time, build resilience, you get to practice your pitch, you get to learn about your own products and services uh, much more effectively. And I think it really helps uh, build the ramp time actually for a lot of new reps. Um, with that said, you know, we absolutely can't ignore the other channels. And I know my experience in you know general principles is that it takes anywhere between five and eight touch points to get a meaningful next step with a prospect and so uh you know for anyone who's a golfer out there can you get your holes in one absolutely can you sometimes pick up the phone and it just happens absolutely right but if we're talking in general principles and we're thinking about that five to eight it does often mean that you might need to attempt to call and follow up with an email and then try a linkedin message and make sure that you've got a level of sequencing around you know some manual ways of connecting with customers and some automation as well mm -hmm. what's your what's your take on this so i think there's a really uh, healthy debate around velocity and quality right so do i make more calls speak to more people spend less time researching less time hanging out on linkedin trying to find out what i'm going to say to them and personalizing or do i spend you know, this hyper personalization thing where I might only target 10 people a day, but I'm going to really work to personalize the outreach and stand out. And I think you can, you can quite happily, you know, be a swinging voter on that. But sure. equally, I think, and I think a lot of it depends on the sector you're in and what you're, you're doing as well. Where do you sit with your outreach and with what you do? Do you tend yeah. to focus on velocity a bit more or do you tend to focus on really, you know, drilling down and trying to personalize the outreach? Yeah, I'm going to answer and I'd love to get your perspective mm. as well, Ryan, because you're, sure. you're absolutely right. This feels very topical at the moment. Mm. Um, if someone asked me to choose a camp, I, I'm absolutely choosing Velocity every day of the week. A mm. um, couple of reasons behind that. One is that um, it's not easy to get a hold of people. And, and what I often see is some people will spend hours and hours and, and days and weeks and they built the most amazing kind of hypothesis and messaging around all of their accounts. And then they spend the next week trying to get in touch with all of them and they find that they, you know, get in touch with 3%. Yeah. But at that same point, I've probably already booked about 20 meetings because <laughs> I'm just getting through the volume, right? And so what I do is spend a lot of time making sure I know and understand our product to the same level as a, a sales engineer, for example. Yeah. So when I get on that call, I can talk and I, and I can articulate. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely, definitely focus on volume and, and velocity over and above. The precursor I'll say to that is that I look to try and tier out my account. So I've got that kind of concept of tier one, tier two and tier three. And tier one are kind of, you know, the, the gold standard. If you want to view it that way, there's a lot more uh, research and homework done. But as I kind of come down on tiers and go a little bit wider, I absolutely leverage volume mechanisms to, to speak to as many people as I possibly can. And generally that that has proven to be successful for me. But I'd love to hear your perspective too. 
Yeah, no, I, do you know what? I mirror everything you said there. I am, um, uh, I acknowledge both, and there are absolutely times where velocity is not the right thing to do, but it's rare. It's rare, in my opinion, if you're leaning towards one. And I think you made a fantastic point earlier about the ramp time. So, a new SDR for me should be given the phone and nothing else for the first couple of weeks because yeah. they will learn so much faster by having two way conversations with prospects than they will sending emails that they don't get responses to, um, where basically all they're doing is templates. And I also think it's so much harder to get, if you've got a team of reps, to get people who can be good on the phones in conversation and good copywriters and good on social and building out a pro and, 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 and it's, you know, doing videos and it's, it's tough. Yeah. Get them doing one thing and being really good at it and then start to layer in other things yeah. if you've got reps that are open to that and if it's the right thing. But I, I think there's, there's a market out there that is very, very guilty of trying to look cool. And I use the word cool because I was born in the 80s. So apologies for anybody that, that wasn't. But, you know, it, it's it's a fashionable, trendy thing to to to, to personalise and to do to do outreach that isn't volume based and reps can hide behind tools. Yeah. Uh, and it's more comfortable doing that. But the problem is it doesn't it doesn't pay the bills, it doesn't hit, hit targets. And, and I'd rather be uncomfortable and successful than be and then be comfortable after it after it than be really comfortable and unsuccessful. So for Absolutely. me, yeah, velocity should absolutely play a key role in your yeah. strategy. That doesn't mean we don't personalise to a degree. You know, the old, you will have done this, yellow, you know, yellow pages and research, get the website up. That's all you have to do, right? Website, from a website, I've trained myself just like you would have done to be able to get at least one or two really quick things that I can bring into the conversation if I need it. So it's not just the same for everybody. But absolutely. to spend 10 minutes researching somebody to not speak to them just feels like a very inefficient way of working. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree with you anymore. I mean, and uh, you know, I think it has become quite controversial. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and you see a lot of kind of back and forth, definitely on LinkedIn about this. But you know, re results speak, right? At the end of the day, and I think that it gets to a point where you do sometimes have to test what works for you. Yeah. Um, but I'm just seeing too many examples of people, in my opinion, over investing at that front end, and yeah. sometimes it feels like a a bit of a kind of safety mechanism for them yes. because it feels like you're doing work, but mm. really are you getting yourself closer uh, to your goals and, and metrics that really matter, right? Versus just kind of doing busy work that mm. maybe isn't necessarily driving results as efficiently as you could. Yeah. Um, and so let's get into to, to we're on a cold call. What's your style? How would you how would you describe your your persona and the way that you approach a cold call? Yeah, one thing that's been really interesting for me, and I've, I've spent a lot more time on probably over the last, you know, six to 12 months, is actually studying almost drama and, and theatrics. Because what you come to realize on a call is simply the way you open the call and the energy that you bring to it can be an absolute game changer in the outcome, right? If I came on this podcast right now and I said, hey, Owen, how are you doing? Uh, lovely to speak to you and you're all... Versus, hey, Owen, great to be here. Lovely to be on this podcast right now. It's a completely different energy, right? And bringing that same kind of differential to a call can be transformative. So one of the things I, I really try to practice is bringing that energy. I've um, got a standing desk for a reason, right? Allows me to project and pronunciate myself a little bit more. And then kind of going into the, the call itself, you know, there's a number of different ways that I'll typically try and open the call. Um, but what I try and do is, is quite early, get some kind of what I call validation event where I get someone to really confirm. For a particular thing within the business, because I've found that that kind of uh, from an EQ perspective, get someone in the mind frame to want to kind of continue. And then the last strand I'll just kind of throw out there, and actually, Owen, I'd love to get your perspective on this, because this is another thing I see mixed opinions on, is whether you should or shouldn't ask for permission to be able to, in essence, get into the meat and the crux of the call. Now, for me personally, I'm I'm on the fence of, of not doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't go on calls and, and within seconds say, hey, you know, is now a good time? Or can I ask you for more time? I'll often sometimes maybe say, uh, you know, I, I appreciate I may have caught you unannounced, but then I go into that validation event. Mm -hmm. But I don't try and give early windows to just get off the call because mm. I find in many scenarios people will will, will take that. But um, again, controversial one. So, what do you think? Yeah, it's a good one. So, um, I, I've 
I was trained, and I think when you're trained to do something, you, it becomes it just becomes really natural in the early days to say, "Hey, Alex, as I've been calling from there, just hoping you can help me out really quickly." And what it does, I, 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 I've always used that phraseology, that, that phraseology, because it kind of you don't really get a response, and you're not really asking for one, but you sure. do do a little pause there, and you occasionally, and these actually become really good callbacks. You actually get. Do you know what? I can't because I'm in the middle of something, but right. could you give me a call back later? And I'm like, yeah, give me your email. I'll put an invite in. We speak at a time. You've almost got yourself a meeting. And there's some, there's some positives that come off of that. Sure. You, 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 you don't want to invite. I certainly wouldn't say is now a good time. Um, again, sure. yes, no, closing it off. It's very easy. I think you sound like a sales rep. And the moment you sound like a sales rep, the moment I get bring buyer's worst behavior out, right? I get, I get, sure. I get buyer behavior and buyer's, Buyers aren't nice people. Let's be fair. I mean, they, they you yeah, know, when I go into buying mode, I'm not the normal Owen. I'm a different character for some reason um, until I learn to trust that person. And you're not doing that at that stage of the conversation. So yeah. I'm a big fan of permission, but a bit later on. So sure. I would always say sure. that where I build permission in would say, look, Alex, I've told you a bit about what we do. Obviously, I don't know enough about your situation to know if this even makes sense. Do you mind if I just ask you a couple of quick questions? And I, I like to ask for permission to ask questions. Because sure. I think it's quite overbearing to go in and say, tell me about this, tell me about that, tell me about that. It, but, but you read the conversation, right? Where if you, if you do that, it's a really nice way to get them to say, yeah, do you know what, ask me questions. And you've kind of got their, you're in permission, it's two-way, it's trust-based. Yeah. And you, you don't feel like you're, you, you, you're kind of, you're begging to be there. You feel like you've earned the right to be there. And I think it gives you a little bit of a confidence boost in the conversation as well. But it also gives the prospect a bit later on a chance to say, look, I know what you do now, but no, and this is why. And now I'm handling objections. I'm talking about what's important to them rather than what's important to me. So I, I like permission, but I like it later in the conversation, not too early. I think it's spot on. No, and uh, you know we're on the same page with that. You know, to be specific, it's really calling it out when it's at the very beginning, because yeah. what you find is that immediately you're, you're probably cutting fifty to sixty yeah. percent of your potential attempts in half because. Yeah. You know, if you contact someone who doesn't know that you're calling them, they don't know who you are and it's yeah. it's unannounced and you say, is now a good time? Here's a route out the door. They're probably going to take it because they don't know who you are. There's no no like or trust factor. You're just someone calling them unannounced. Right. So mm. I love what you said about um, kind of, you know, asking for permission a little bit later on the call. Mm. There's a lot of different phrases that I think can really warm someone into yeah. a conversation. Sometimes I just say, look, I'd love to get your feedback and your perspective. I know you've been in this space for a long time. I want to walk through a few things with you. I'd just love to get your thoughts and feedback. Right. Yeah. These kind of things really help warm someone into that. And, you know, it gives them a sense that you, you actually value their time and value the fact that you, you're connected with them right now. Yeah, and I think it's about layers, isn't it? So that initial part, when you think about, you know, in order to get a meeting, you've got to move trust from never knowing you before to I trust you enough to believe that I should give you some of my time, right? And that's that's quite a big shift in two to 10 minutes, which, you know, is kind of the range of those calls and probably more so towards the two more often, I would have thought. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of movement there. And I think, and you think about the, what the, that first thing that comes out of your mouth, what do they know about you? You phoned them, I don't know you, and you're asking me if I've got time very little reason to actually say yes at that point in time which is yeah. why i'm a a, 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 um, a big advocate for not asking how are you i just think wasting time at the top of the call with something that's has no value to the conversation doesn't move us forwards is probably a little bit insincere yes no just shuts down the conversation get past it the sooner you can get into actual real conversation versus niceties at the beginning the more value you add faster and the more you move the chance of that trust you know going up rather than that rather than them going out the door so yeah i think it's a really really good good point but interestingly a point that gets missed in reps training and i'm, yeah. I'm keen to move on to that because i think when we look at particularly outbound sales yeah there is a massive gap in the market for good leadership good development and training around some of these really basic things. What a basic for you and I, because we learned on the job and we've done it for a while. Sure. Why do you think that is? Do you think people just don't put weight on outbound or are there not enough, enough people that get it? What, what's going on? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's just been a bit of a seismic shift with the rise of these fantastic, you know, enablement and mm. outreach style tools that yeah. you know, give reps a, a, a lot of different routes, right? A lot of different paths to reach someone. And it just kind of feels like the market is really shifted now. There's a, a massive focus on some of the things we spoke about using the tooling, uh, doing personalization through that, mm. uh, kind of being able to, 
uh, you know, allow that to constitute to part of some of the core metrics that SDRs are measured on, right? And what's fundamentally happened is because, because of that, I think some of the, the raw messaging that to me will probably never really change to be, you know, as in picking up the phone and having conversations and, you know, getting that volume, to me, that will never really change, right? And for as long as I'm ever coaching or enabling someone, that's just always going to be at the heartbeat of what I'm going to teach and encourage. Because I think the broader point towards this is most SDRs at some point want to move on to becoming an AE and then want to continue to grow their careers forward from that. And so when you're starting to look at that kind of growth path and that trajectory as well, the other part is, you know, when you become an AE, you've got to deal with a ton of objections, right? You've got to start to get into the weeds, have conversations, win over different stakeholders. And I think spending all of your time on channels that are solely messaging based, they're not adding a ton to your game that's really going to add value to you as you want to grow your career and become an AE. Going through kind of the grind and making those calls and facing the rejections and dealing with the objections, coming back, writing down what worked, what didn't work, going and speaking to your manager and saying, you know, I had these 10 calls, they worked really well and these 10 didn't work well. Can mm -hmm. we diagnose why? Let's role play it. That is going to be what's going to set you up for a fan fantastic foundation as an AE. And some people, as I've kind of grown my career as an individual contributor, they've asked, you know, Alex, what's been behind your success? I honestly put a ton of the success I've had today down to my very first role. I honestly do, because actually as an AE today, yeah. half of my job is exactly what I did 10 years ago, right? I'm hustling, I'm in the trenches and I'm doing all those same things, but I do it with a smile on my face because I say, this is who I am, right? And so any SDR out there or anyone who's early in their career that even is getting encouraged to sit you know, do a lot of the messaging channels, I would encourage them to go out and be bold, right? And break that kind of status quo now. Go and start doing something a little bit different and, you know, bring that to the forefront. Sorry, that, that felt like I was going into a bit of a rant. <laughs> but... I love it. You carry on, Alex. It's fine. <laughs> it's, but do you know what? We invite, we invite you on because you can add value. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm lapping this up, mate. Absolutely lapping this up. You've got so much knowledge and experience and what I've, what I absolutely love about you is you're I think you're a massive exception because right. most people that are, are great individual contributors at SDR or AE level get to the point where 10 years into the, their career they've moved way past that and their advice becomes outdated to some degree but you're in it still so not only are you in it today you're in it and you've been in it for for, for a while and you're clearly getting more and more successful all the time but you've chosen to keep hustling and I love that absolutely love that because that the, they can't be somebody better to get advice from so you yeah. keep going my friend you keep going you've got it. so much to to give thanks i was going to ask you know what has it been for you as well right you know you you said you're a, a, a an 80s baby excuse me so you've obviously been you know retaining this for, for quite some time yourself so what has it been for, for you um so yeah so, so this is really interesting for me because I founded an organization as a CEO and a founder, you've moved, you, you tend to move away from, um, from, from a lot of that individual contribution, but I, I always just drag back to it always because I am a, I'm a sales rep at heart, right? That's where I started just like you, um, in order to be a good CEO and a good founder, you have to do other things, but I don't think I'll ever stop selling and contribute. I don't think I'll ever stop picking up the phone and talking to people. Um, I choose not to get into, at an individual level, other channels and personalise outreach, that kind of stuff. We've got a team who do that and they're very good at it and we adopt it. But for me, it's just about talking to people. And I absolutely love doing this, talking to people now, but but helping people to become, just like you, the best sales reps that they can become and, um, and, and embracing the, the power of conversation, but also helping people get over the fear of it because I think people do come to their careers early stage now with a fear of conversation. Society has built that both professionally and outside of work as well. So sure. yeah, I think I think for me, th th there's going back to the question I asked you, there's a real gap around development of people. I think we've, we've forgotten about the phone as a channel to some degree. I think we've forgotten about two-way conversation and we've forgotten about the fact that I can influence people when I've got them on a conversation far better than via email, far faster. There's so many benefits, but it's hard work. Let's be fair, Alex. It's not yeah. easy. 
right? It, it's, you get rejected at face or vocally, verbally rather than over email. You know, yeah. you have to you have to hear no. You can be highly inefficient for a couple of hours a day easily. Um, yeah. There's lots of reasons to ignore the phone because of the process. But the result, when done well, is 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 absolutely worth going for, and and that's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about getting people to understand that you you, you have to, like anything, take the pain of the process to get the result. I always refer back to something that Mo Farah said. He said, you, "There's a difference between somebody who wants to be an Olympic champion and somebody who wants the process of becoming an Olympic champion. You have to enjoy the training. You have to enjoy the the, the, the early morning rises and the sleeping with the, the oxygen box over your head uncomfortably. You have to enjoy that process and the the, the, the the day to day for the moment every four years. And I think it's the same with 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 cold calling and prospecting. You've got to enjoy the." no conversations and the, the gatekeeper navigation navigation and they're trying to get hold of people and the flipping the pages in the yellow pages and you know 10 15 years ago you've got to enjoy that yeah to get to the wins and if you don't enjoy it you'll give up before the end and i think it's a really interesting concept so i guess question for you then owen is you know someone might be listening to this and say well owen almost how do you enjoy it right are you are you born someone who just thrives in that environment and if you're just not that person you haven't got it or can you in some way kind of train or recondition your mind to start to enjoy that journey and enjoy that grind uh, i think it's, it's it's one worth unpacking yeah I, I think so can you answer your own question though because I want, I want to get your opinion first i i, I, will, I will say something but i'd Absolutely. love to hear what your thoughts are yeah i i think that I often talk about motivation being important because I think mm -hmm. I often talk about the characteristics that you can't teach versus the ones you can. Yeah. You know, passion, drive, hunger. I can't really teach someone that. So your your fundamental why that gets you out of bed every day is of critical importance. Yeah. Because if it isn't compelling enough, the reality is you're not gonna you're not going to be, in my opinion, a top tier performer yeah. because what sales is guaranteed to give you is some very, very, very tough days. It's gonna give you some amazing highs and it's also gonna give you some of the lowest lows. And when it gets low, if you don't have something in your mind, in your heart, a desire that goes beyond the norm, you're just gonna sink. Yeah. And the amount of churn I've seen over my entire career, I can't put into words. And I'm sure, I mean, you, you can mm -hmm. probably attest to that yeah. as well, right? You know. I've, I've seen tons and tons of people come in and, and, and go out yeah. in most cases because they see the outcomes and miss the inputs. And I've had, you know, a lot of friends and people around me that have seen certain things I've achieved and thought, wow, this is great. But they don't see the 5 a.m. starts. They don't see the thousands of phone calls on a weekly mm -hmm. or monthly basis. Right. And it's tough. But I am driven by several things. Right. Some things that are legacy based, some things that are based around myself, some things that are based around my family that I just wake up every day and I just want to get after it, right? Mm. I just absolutely want to get after it. And I feel that same way every single day. So I love it because every rejection I get, I know I make those 100 calls. Every 100 calls I make, I'm going to book two meetings. Yeah. When I get that rejection, I'm just a little bit closer. And I get rejected again, I'm just a little bit closer, right? And so that's a really long-winded way of saying I don't think that you can specifically teach it in someone, but I think you can help someone ignite their own flame yeah. by helping them connect to their yeah. why, in essence. Actually, you no, know, spot on. So my, my, I wanted you to answer because I, did, I didn't want to see you thunder, but also because um, I, I, I was really interested in your in your take on it. I didn't want to influence your take on it. Sure. My, my, my take is really simple. So if I go back to my personal journey, I am um, not somebody who doesn't care what people think of me. I absolutely do. I like to be like. So going into a job where you get rejected all day was really hard for me to start. And I remember it, but I, but I had the sense I was good at it, but I didn't enjoy it to start with. So right. going back to your question, it's not for me, it wasn't a natural thing. It absolutely wasn't a natural thing. What I did, though, was two things. And your, your first point was one of them. I had enough drive to want to push through it. And enough pride to want to learn how to do something and do it well and i was driven enough to see the success and i enjoyed the highs enough to to, to, to warrant the lows um mm. but i learned to understand it and i think this is my advice to people if you understand something 
and you take the time to understand the what's and the why's and the, the mecha mechanisms, it's far easier to deal with. So, you know, it, 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 I understand that I have to go through a bit like you, I have to go through X number of conversations. I understand the data to, to, to get one person to say yes. I understand now that when somebody's saying no, they're not saying no to me, they're saying no to the offering. They might be saying no to my pitch as well, who knows, but they're never going to tell me that, it's unlikely. But I also understand that it's OK, that that person won't remember me, that, you know, and when you, st when you start to unpack it and start to use apply common sense and logic, you very quickly get to the point where you can process that like a machine a little bit more. And that was what it, so you, you dampen your emotions from being rejected, which we all have at some degree. There are some people out there that just don't give a, you know, they don't, they're just they're just wired the way it doesn't matter to them. Just keep going. I yeah. think you can build your resilience through common sense, logic, understanding something. Sure. And then it starts to compartmentalize it over here rather than over here, left brain yeah. says right or whatever. So, yeah, I, I think it is um, very natural for everybody to come in and not enjoy the rejection. But if you want the end goal enough and you're motivated enough and you understand that's part of the process, it's just yeah. like go back to Mo Farah, just like running. Do you think he enjoys the pain when he's nine kilometers into a 10K? at threshold all the way around yeah i mean the 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 the, the, the build up and the lactic acid i mean that is painful he doesn't enjoy that he enjoys the result enough to want to push through it and i think it's so, about understanding that yeah and uh, you know i think one thing i'll add that kind of piggybacks off that point is you know i often say when you see a, a scenario or something that makes you feel uncomfortable walk towards it Right. And I think that that's sometimes one of the most fundamental things. And I'm not specifically talking about sales here. I'm just talking about life. Right. Walk, walk towards things that give you that sense of anxiety. Walk towards things that immediately feel uncomfortable. It is a muscle that I, I feel that you can train. Right. Yeah. And you've got to get to a situation where, you know, you've got to dare to be great sometimes. Right. Um, it sounds trivial, but you know, we're, we're, we're here once we get one run, you've got to run at things sometimes, right? You, the, the, the worst thing that happens is you, is you learn something new. Uh, in other words, to me, there's no real bad experiences. You either learn something new that shapes the way that you go forward, uh, or it's just going to be a positive experience. that's going to drive the result you want. So, um, yeah. you know, when you seek discomfort actively, do you remember the first meeting you booked? I've got to be honest, I don't remember exactly the first one, yeah. but the, the, the memory that stands out to me the most from kind of, let's say, back in that that day was uh, the day that I set the record for the most amount of meetings booked in a day, which was eight. Um, and I won uh, some tickets, uh, some box tickets that our MD at the time gave us uh, to go and see Arsenal. Uh, that is my team. So... I hope I haven't lost their <laughs> lost any followers by. Uh... Listen, guys, there's not long left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it is more that memory because it was like uh, it felt like a validation uh, for me after you know dropping out, you know having all of the the lows that came along with that, and then that day where I just really felt on top of the world, you know, booking those eight meetings. Uh, that was just the day that kind of stood out to me um, from that era. What about you? you know, what's interesting there is you picked a day that stood out to you where you were successful. This is what I always say to people, you won't remember the notes. Trust me, you will remember your first meetings, the first day you hit a record, you'll remember hitting your monthly quota. You won't remember the months you don't. You won't remember the conversations yeah. where people say no to you very often, unless there's something really stands out and, and you take with you in your future years, all of those positive experiences. Um, and that's the thing to remember that we absorb positivity and we take it with us, we let go of negativity. And I think that's a, a really good message for reps that are maybe struggling with the notion of dealing with that rejection. Um, very true dealing with that objection so much so look, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up with you I'm gonna ask you just some of your advice so I would imagine a lot of people listening to this are going to be individual contributors who tune into this one who just want to go how does Alex do it so what advice would you give to people what do they need to go and do after this to, to make themselves better yeah I, I would say to really think in your own mind about the science of selling right and to be a little bit more specific um I spoke at the beginning about having that consistency in your performance. And what I fundamentally believe is that you've got the, the, the things that you can't teach, the passion, the drive, the hunger, um, the rest of it can be teached and built and you can improve upon. And so you look at, you know, some sales legends, the likes of John McMahon, who wrote a phenomenal book like The Qualified mm -hmm. Sales Leader, you know, that should be 
beside everyone's bed, right, as a blueprint for how to take someone from uh, a level of baseline interest to, yeah. you know, working them through, walking them through a cycle uh, and, and, of course, signing a deal. And I think that that book and the execution that you see from businesses under that banner, you know, MongoDB, uh, Snowflake and all of the, you know, Snowflake's the most successful software IPO in history. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn from these organizations and understand how are they able to execute with so much consistency over an extended period of time? Exactly what we're also doing here at, at, at Lacework, right? So what I'd encourage reps to do is, is to not be uh, unconsciously competent, but go and commit yourself to becoming consciously competent uh, through the, the science of selling. Love it. Absolutely love it. And this is all about elevating the industry and getting people to understand that yeah, we, we can learn about it. We don't just get better by doing, we get better by leading, by, by reading, listening, absorbing, listening to people like you share your ideas. And, and, and my word, have you got some have you got some experience coming out? And do you know what? I've, I, Alex genuinely have enjoyed this. this is one of my favourite conversations that I've had on the on the pod. And I, you know, I, I say that honestly, it's it's been exceptional. I, I think we could do another five and keep going. Um, <laughs> And um, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll join me back on the show at some point in the future because I think we we, we could have a lot of fun um, pulling this apart even more. But we've we've had a great conversation nonetheless. To, to wrap up, um, I was going to say where should people get in touch with you if they want to. I'm guessing the answer to that is LinkedIn, given how much time you spend there. But who should get in touch with you? Tell us a bit about that. Who should be talking to you about lace work and and uh, and and you know where where where's the best place to hang out with you? Yeah, so, you know, from a Lacework perspective, you know, anyone who's interested in, in cloud security or infrastructure, uh, of course, get in touch and, and absolutely happy to help. Uh, you know, from a personal perspective, you're spot on and I, I pretty much live on LinkedIn as a second home. <laughs> so feel free to reach out in any way. I, I think I'd be remiss not to also say that because of the amount of DMs and, and questions I've been getting on this topic, um, I've been starting to work through building a, a, a private community. Currently, it's on a, a wait list. I'm kind of working with a, a small amount, but uh, please also do get in touch uh, via my website, alexelaine.com forward slash wait list. And uh, anyone who wants to, to up their game, uh, register your interest and uh, I'd love to love to help. Alex, you're an absolute gen and a very clever one at that. And, and, and clearly you. a pretty hard worker as well, I think. It just comes over in your personality and the way that you talk. And I'm sure that anybody who's watched or listened to this today will agree that you can't not have taken some really good ideas off the back of this conversation. So thank you for sharing your um, your thoughts and your experience. Very much appreciated. And we'll speak again soon. Absolute pleasure. See you soon. Thank you.